With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered and Happy New Year. This is my very first episode of 2023, and I'm so excited to have the celebrated male performer here, Lucas Frost. We've worked together a bunch. Um, I actually shot him when he was very new to the industry, so we kind of have some fun stories together. So um, let me introduce to you the man, Lucas Frost. Nice to meet everyone. So, um, (laughs) as I was saying to you before we started, um, Danny, who's like one of my, um, Patreon supporters and basically like supports me on every platform. I love you, Danny, uh, was saying that we got to talk about the Julian story, okay? which does take us back to the very beginnings of the first, our relationship, (laughs) the very first one. Yes. That was like some digital playground. It was digital playground. It was flesh. Flesh, it that was, was it. Flesh two, I think. I believe the female talent had just won that like game the porn game show or something. Yes, DP star. Arden yeah, which, Alexander. That's who it was. I yes. was like, mm, probably gonna skip on the name or yeah, blank on okay. it. But that's okay. I, I remember Aria very well. I worked with her a lot. Um, so so let me just tell the story about how it. I how I met Lucas. So I was shooting this big feature for Digital Playground called Flesh Two. Starring Aria Alexander, Cherie Deville, Brittany. Um, oh my God. Brittany Amber? Yes, thank you. Fuck, sorry, Brittany. Like, Brittany Amber, I love you. And I don't know why I spaced on your last name for a second. Uh, Brittany Amber and, and some other people. And my talent, my male talent that I had booked for, it was just like a, a one dungeon scene with it Aria a, it was an in and out I wasn't yeah. really in the movie at all no it was just a just a performance no it wasn't dialogue a main, it wasn't a yeah. main part and my male talent canceled I can't remember why and of course it was like the day before and of course you know I have this huge production with all of these people this expensive location and I'm like fuck I don't have any male talent nobody's available because if you're a good male talent you're fucking always booked yeah. And so uh, I was speaking to one of the agents. They're like, look, we got this new guy. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want new talent. You guys fucking always fail. Talent, like too much is riding on this guy's shoulders. Like I can't, I can't do a new guy. But it became clear that I had no option. Um, and of course the agent was like, no, man, he's really solid, da, 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 which is what they always say. And I was like, fuck, I'm so fucked. This guy's going to come in. He's going to fail. It's going to ruin the scene. And I don't know what I'm going to do. You're going to have to shoot it again anyways. I'm going to have to shoot it again with somebody else. Like, I was terrified. So the name of the guy's character was Julian. In the script, right? Yes. Yeah. And so Lucas comes in. And I don't know why. This, This happens to me. Sometimes if I initially, like, connect you with a certain name, even if it's not your actual name um, like that sticks with me kind of forever. It's like a weird brain thing. So I was introduced to him as Lucas Frost, but in my head he was Julian and I just couldn't stop calling him Julian. Uh, So we do the scene and he fucking kills it, like kills it. I remember shooting it and just being like, thank 
fucking God. Oh my God, this guy can perform and just being so relieved. I feel like even during the scene, like Aria looked at me like past the camera and was like, all right, <laughs> like this is happening. <laughs> Cause she was also very worried about yeah. it. Um, As everybody is naturally with the new yeah, male performer. Of course. And then, but then it was like, okay, you know, the end part comes, the coming on cue. That sometimes is the hardest thing for a guy. And I was like, this might be where he fails. He may not be able to do the cum shot. And then like, but at least that I can like fake. I can take some like syringe off, <laughs> off camera and just go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or like some like, yep. coconut like creamer and just squirt. <laughs> I've, Oh Dude, God. I've I've like taken I put like fake cum on a spoon and like flung it at the girl off camera. Like I've had to do so much dumb shit. Stunt cock it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had to have stunt cocks come in. Another guy has to come in like for the cum shot. That is who that is that is a that is tough. It's interesting. Now you gotta find a, a dick look alike. Yeah. <laughs> like, dick- good luck. Yeah, I mean seriously. And I'm uncut, so that would be hard to do. <laughs> I mean, we're not uh, over in Europe. It'd probably be easier, but over right. here, like that's right. pretty hard to find. Yeah. So, um, but he did <clears throat> it like no problem. Like he nailed it. And I just remember being so fucking excited. And Aria afterwards too was like, "Oh my god, he was amazing." <laughs> because I don't know if you realize this. I feel like you do because you've been in the industry a long time. But as a producer, like it is very there. You guys are in short supply. Like solid male talent who's like good looking is professional, shows up to set, the girls like him, does the scene, like, you know, can remember the lines, just like, it's all of these things that have to come together to make like the perfect male porn It's rare to find the complete package. It's hard, it's very hard. And I don't even consider myself the complete package, but I mean, I I tried to be as professional in every area as that I could, and if there was room for improvement, definitely take the constructive criticism and grow from it. Um. And so, yeah, so whenever there's like a new guy that comes in that can do that all, the a whole industry gets excited. We're all like, oh my God, there's a new bell talent. And then yeah. we're all like texting each other, like, oh, you gotta try this guy. Like he can actually do it. So, um, so yeah, so that was my first introduction to Lucas Frost, but the Julian name stuck with me forever after that. Yeah. To, and to the point, even today, and this is like, how long ago is this? How long has it been in the industry? Seven years. Okay, so this is seven years ago. Yeah. And I still, my brain still goes, <clears throat> Julian. Well, Michelle helped kick it along too because she just kept writing you on it. Yeah. She just made my name Julian on every call sheet That's from there true. on out. That's true. Yeah, she, Michelle just was ign- she just ignored the fact that my name was Lucas and she was like, nope, it's Julian. She just <laughs> drove it home. I was like, shit. All right. Well, I guess I got three names. Do you remember that scene? Yes. Do you remember like how you felt? Did you feel the pressure of coming into that scene? Because that was what? I know it wasn't your first scene. No, it wasn't my first scene, but it was close to my first full boy-girl sex scene. Okay. It was probably my fourth or fifth. Mm -hmm. But I had also been dating a female performer for a year before I got into actual performing. So I would shoot content with her. I would shoot some live cam shows with her occasionally. So I wasn't new to being in front of camera or performing with somebody in front of the camera, but it was within my first like five professional boy girl scenes for sure. Yeah, But it's a different story when you're on set with like a bunch of people and yes. lights and a huge production. You're not in production. a bedroom with your girlfriend. Yeah, and you know that like all of these people are counting on you to come through. Did you feel that pressure? Oh yeah, I still feel the pressure. I mean, seven years in, I'm obviously more confident, but I had a male performer talk to me one time about it and he's newer and he was like, I just, how do you get over the nerves? And I was like, they don't go away. Yeah, I'm seven years in. I, I still get sweaty palms here and there, but yeah. you just learn to work through them. Mm-hmm. Just like anything. The first time you do it, it's going to be a little bit scarier. But the fir- the more you do it and the more you do it well and the more you work at it, the more confident you become in it. Yeah. And I feel like that also just suggests that you like your job and you care yeah. about your job. Yeah. 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 Because I, I know what you mean. Like I still get, you know, I've been producing for 24 years. And sometimes, you know, certain shoots that are more complicated than others, I still get like some of the best athletes in the world are throwing up in locker rooms before games still to this day. They've been playing the sport their entire lives and they're still throwing up in the in the locker room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like that. Those kind of nerves are are good. Right. If you don't let them overwhelm you, Mm -hmm. because I mean, you you see it every day on set when guys fail. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. They fail in their head before they fail down below. Yeah. Like it, our job, especially as male talents, is 95% mental. Yeah. It, so how do you do that? Like, how do you get out of your head and into your body? It's, it's not always the easiest thing, especially because you have to learn to compartmentalize really well. Like you can't be dragged. Say you have relationship problems at home. You step onto set. You can't be sitting there thinking about those problems yeah. while trying to work on getting yourself ready for the scene. Mm -hmm. So learning to compartmentalize the two and then leaving personal life at the door and then stepping on set. Now I'm Lucas Frost and uh, I have a job to do. Mm -hmm. There's also like a lot of the industry cheats in my opinion and mm -hmm. uses some uh, pharmaceutical assistance. Mm -hmm. I chose when I was new to not go that route because I cared about using my dick in the future and when I retired or yeah. And I had read plenty of stories and done my fair enough research on the pharmaceuticals and they eventually stop working. Mm -hmm. And then you stop working. Mm -hmm. and I didn't ever want that to be my thing. And I wanted to prove to younger kids that you don't need a pill to do your job. Right. You need a good mindset. You need a healthy body and you need to eat well. Mm -hmm. And if you have those, I mean, it's pretty much just a normal day. So you still don't need to ever see that's OK. So that's remarkable because I know a lot of guys think that you have to like guys have to eventually rely on that. And, you know, I never because people do ask me all the time. They're like, do they use Viagra? And 90, I honestly 98 percent of the, the male performers in the industry are on Viagra, Cialis or the injectable. Right. Which is Caber Jack. Yes. Yes which can like degrade and like well twist you, you start as a male penis. a new male talent and your agents like here take this blue pill yeah well after using it every day for a year and a half two years one pill is not going to cut it mm -hmm. now you're in the world of taking two pills which two viagra is pretty sketchy yeah so now you're having health problems you, you get headaches you get migraines you and now you're reliant on it yeah I never wanted to become reliant on something like that. And then right. the pill stops working altogether. Mm -hmm. Now you got to go to the shot. Now you're injecting every day. Yeah. Then the shot wears off because your body builds up a tolerance to it. Now, if you inject as much as you need to get hard, you could kill yourself or your dick doesn't go down for seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to go to the hospital and get it drained, which none of that sounds like fun to me. And I was oh, like, look, if God. I can't do this job without having to take a pill every day, then I shouldn't be here. Mm. And I still feel the same way, but a lot of people don't. I know a lot of agencies pretty much hand their kids needles when they, when they're like, here, this is how you do it, Interesting. which is wrong because yeah. they're not telling them the ramifications that come along with it. Yeah. Yeah. There can definitely be, I it's mean, a turn and burn method. Yeah. I had a conversation with Lena Paul about this and she was talking about how, you know, a lot of times when that cabbage act does wear off or they get to a point where they can't get hard anymore, then they, have to get the penis pump installed and then you got a robot penis yeah. and i somehow like didn't know about this what I, yeah i really? don't know i think i don't know because i'm not a performer right so yeah. i'm a i'm a producer and a director so i like sometimes i think those intimate conversations You're between really performers i'm not really a party to that yeah so um the robot penis thing threw me mm -hmm. but uh oh trust me when i have conversations with people like civilians mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely mind blowing to most people. Yeah. The, the Viagra is not, the Cialis isn't. Right. The, the injectables and the penis pumps, that blows most people's minds. They're yeah. like, wait, what? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so how did you actually get into the industry? You said you were dating someone in the industry yeah. uh, for a while. Is that like, had you ever thought about getting into porn before you started dating her? Or was that really your first introduction to the idea? The, I mean, Kind of. I was pretty happy just being a performer's girlfriend or boyfriend. Mm -hmm. But then as I started to learn, she would come home. She's like, this guy failed. He was 19. He was on three Viagra. And I'm like, this isn't right. Yeah. Or the guy was on so much Viagra that he took an hour to, to come. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, OK. And then her agents, who didn't have any male talent at the time, started approaching me. And they're like, hey, would you you're already like shooting content with her and we think we could get you a lot of work. And I was like, OK, send out some pictures and tell me what you got. And they came back to me and said, we have you booked out all 30 days this month if you can do these three scenes. The three trial scenes I did were actually with Mike Quasar. Wait, hold on, hold on. They had you booked out 30 days? As long as I could do the job. They were like, everybody Every like single day. Yeah. They had you who. Well, just by sending out my just, pictures. And you just started. Yeah. 
I hadn't Every even signed a contract. Day. Nothing. Yeah. And they're like, okay, if you can do the first three scenes, we will get you booked out all 30 days. Like we have people waiting for you. But that's like, I mean, don't you, don't you need a break? Don't you need a day off? I didn't really understand the concept of a day off my first four <laughs> years. I worked every day, sometimes two or three times a day for the first four years of my career. I feel like you have filled in for me as on a second scene before. Yeah, for sure. I feel like like some guy didn't show up or failed and I called you and I was like, Julian? Yep, and just I was kidding. like, I just, I just popped on this set, but I could be there in an hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very common if you're a popular new male performer. Yeah. They will use you. Yeah. You will get used. So, okay, so your first three scenes were with Mike Quasar, who we love. Love Mike. Love Mike. Everybody loves Mike. Great friend of mine. Um, <laughs> how is that? Because Mike's like, you know, he's an entity in, in, in itself. Mike and I have an odd relationship. We love each other, but also can't stand each other there was a period of time where like i was going through some stuff and i told my agents to stop booking me with mike i was like look tell him i'm booked tell him i'm busy tell him this tell him tell him whatever just i'm not working for him right now he's a little too down in the dumps right now his his humor and my humor are not working together right now like it's a little dark i was he like does, it's not a good humor, energy it's not a good energy for me to produce an erection right now <laughs> and they're like okay and then he got wind that I actually asked for that. <laughs> and he will never let me live that down. He always gives me shit. You, you remember the time that you actually stopped working for me? <laughs> yeah, well, I had to. <laughs> so, um, okay, so when, so you did, obviously, I'm assuming the scenes went well. This is, yes. pro- this is before you worked with me, yes. right? Was, was there a moment when you were like, oh, wow, like, I can actually do this. This is a serious career. Or was it you were just kind of like going day by day. Like, did, was there a moment where it clicked where you're like, this is like my future, like this is a career? Um, yeah, getting the feedback I got after my first few scenes from people like Mike or Jim Powers when there was a one of my first couple of scenes for Jim Powers, I was shooting and the girl was like, okay, like she made an audible suggestion that I should come. And I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, she's been around a while. She obviously knows it's time for the come shot. Scene's over. And so I come. And Jim looks at me and he's like, did you just? And I was like, yeah, she said. And he's like, I say. (laughs) I say when you come. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, I can come again. It's cool. Like, He's like, you can what? And I was like, oh, I won't even lose wood. Like, I can get you as much footage as you want. And I'll come again without losing wood back to back. And he's like, I got to see this. And started rolling the camera. He's like, okay, do it. And I did it. I came back to back without losing an erection. And he was like, I think you're supposed to be here. <laughs> and I kind of was like, oh, that's not common for people to be able to do that. I was like, oh, all right. Sounds good. Like, I guess I will be here then as long as I can. That's when you knew you were definitely cut out for the job. Yeah. Quasar made a similar comment because I was, uh, when you work as much as I did as a new male performer, you get a little sensitive down below. Like mm-hmm. You get rubbed raw. The girl's on her period. She shoves a sponge up there and you're yeah. rubbing through it all day. And so I dealt with sensitivity issues when I was new. And there was a day where uh, 45 seconds after rolling, I looked at Quasar and I was like, I'm going to nut. I was like, I don't know if I can hold this back for another 30 minutes. He's like, well, what do you need to do? And I was like, I'm just going to go into the bathroom. I'm going to come real quick. I'll keep my erection and we'll keep shooting the scene. And I'll come again. And I did it. And he was like, same thing. I, I think you're supposed to be here. You were definitely cut out for this job. <laughs> okay. So I made my initial statement in the industry as being able to come twice in a mm-hmm. day. You're it, like the come twice guy. And directors like that because it's insurance. Mm-hmm. I've had a director yeah. shooting and all of a sudden I pop and you hear a da 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 link and the camera shuts off. Oh, God. And they're like, oh, hold on. Nightmare. It was Shelby Black. And he's like, hold on one second. And he went back to the camera. And he's like, I lost the whole last position in the pop because the battery died or the camera burnt out or something. So there's certain cameras. So I will say the red specifically, if the battery, if the camera shuts off without you turning it off yourself, yeah. the footage does not save. If the battery dies while you're shooting, don't remember that whole what clip, camera he was shooting it. on, but the clips were not there. Yeah. And he looked at me and he's like, how can you do it again? And I was like, yeah, I'll give you the whole next position and another come shot. Just add something to my check. <laughs> he's like, well, thanks for the insurance. Yeah. So I think that like one, I could do the job out of the gate. 
two, I had the fact that I could provide a second pop if necessary mm -hmm. and I could work as much as people wanted me to. Yeah. Also, being natural gave me the ability to go up and down whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. If you inject, your dick's hard. Yeah. They got to shoot the scene now. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's time to go. The dick is hard. That you're, you're on a timer. Mm-hmm. But with a natural dick and the way porn is shot now, the up and down is very requested for mm. male talents. Jerk off here. Get down for a second. We got to shoot this other clip over here. The storyboard stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So yes. The, the up down production style I thrived in because being natural, I had the ability to get my dick hard whenever I wanted. Right, right. And keep it hard and then let it go down and not worry about it for another hour while we did something else. And then when it came time to shoot the actual scene, like I'm ready to go too. Yeah. And you're seven years in the industry. Have you ever failed in a scene? Nope. Really? I got close one time. Wow. Can you <laughs> tell us about the close? One time. Yeah. I was shooting in Arizona for a company and it was just everything that could go wrong that day did. Mm -hmm. The director and the girl got into a fight. I had to play therapist and break that up and make sure she was still good to shoot. Jesus Christ. The personalities don't always yeah. collide well on set. So they were having miscommunication issues and she started crying and I calmed her down and then we got through the scene and she had a sponge in. So it wasn't the most pleasant mm -hmm. to shoot that day. The only lube they had on set was a lube that actually makes my dick go numb. Mm. I don't know why this lube does it. I don't know what's in it. I've researched it. Uh, I really don't understand it. I'm it's not, not spunk, is it? It is. I wasn't going to blast them, but yeah, it is. Yeah, I know. I've heard that from other people. I know. Yeah. But not, spunk lube I'm not is, the only one that's had that issue. That's what I'm saying. I've heard that from <clears> other people. But it's great. It's a great lube for... Um, uh fake cum it looks it looks like fake it looks cum. so that's almost identical yeah but but for that particular reason because people are sensitive to different lubes um i have like a whole collection of lubes that i bring to set like because a good producer should it's true. this company it only had one and it was spunk so i was like well fuck it she's got a sponge and i need something yeah i'll just mentally push past the numbness it's wow. fine i can do that wow and then, I don't know, we got to the last position or close to the last position and I just, I was struggling. Yeah. I was struggling with compartmentalizing my personal life at the time because I had some other shit going on, plus all the drama on set that day. And I was like, I got fed up. And I looked at the director and I was like, I'm done. I yeah. walked off set. I was like, I'm, I'm not finishing this scene. I walked off set, walked outside, tried to compose myself a little bit, came back inside, started packing my set bag and he... The director came over and he's like, look, we got one more position in the pop. I've shot you a lot. I know you can do it. He had more faith in my dick that day than I did. I had quit. <laughs> I, I was ready to fail my first scene. I was like, cool, I'm done. It's fine. I'll take one loss. It's cool. I don't need a perfect record. Yeah. But because he had more faith in my dick working that day than I did, I ended up going back, shooting the last position, shooting the pop, and not failing a scene. You just needed somebody to believe in your penis, Lucas. I know. I didn't. I normally have all the faith in my dick, and <laughs> I did not have the faith in my penis that day. It, it really wasn't so much lo lack of faith in my dick as it was lack of confidence in where my head was at that day. Yeah. Because, like I said, this job is 98% mental for male parents. 100%. So if I don't have my head, I'm fucked. Yeah. And... Being all natural, I especially even more need my head. Yeah. What do you do if you show up and your scene partner is your one not attracted to her or two, she's like a total fucking cunt and is just like impossible to deal with? Like, how do you how do you like get yourself into that that mode where you're like, OK, I'm going to somehow find a way to get excited about having sex with this girl that I kind of can't stand? I just go I approach it from the angle of now I have a job to do hmm. regardless of what's in front of me or the chemistry in front of me I'm still going to get my dick hard I'm going to open up for the camera I'm going to put on a good scene I'm going to place the girl where she looks good to the camera and that's how I get it becomes a day of real work mm -hmm. so then it sounds to me like you kind of go inside I remember there was a, a guy that I used to shoot a lot named Alan and he said that he just had like a Rolodex of scenarios yeah. in his head that he would, and he'd find something that, well, just, and then he'd get his dick hard. I'll find that. something about her that's attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not off the bat personally, like physically attracted to him, I'll find uh, maybe they have a sweet voice. Maybe 
they're funny maybe you know I'll, I'll find something and i'll just focus on that right right and then sometimes that thing is i got a job to do i right. got a paycheck to collect and that's gonna get me through today <laughs> so um your perfect no fail double cum shot penis yes um was recently molded for doc johnson right it was they, tell us about that they actually had to mold my balls separately why is that they didn't fit in the mold <laughs> yeah so so that was interesting to encounter I was yeah like, I, I always knew i had big balls but i didn't realize that they wouldn't fit in a mold that's used to mold some of the biggest dicks in <laughs> porn history i was like come on they, they got to be able to fit you guys have molded like brickzilla and stuff like you got to be able to fit mine nope nope you needed its own mold maybe Apparently. you could sell them as a sep as a separate we set. are, we are and then, working like, on some novelty ideas with them. I've been talking with them. It could be like, buy the penis and the balls. And then you have like a complete set. It's like a collector's you item. You might be able to buy them to hang on the back of your truck one day. Oh, yeah. Those guys that always hang those balls from the back of their truck. Yep. These will be authentically molded from my actual package. <laughs> so how was that? What was that experience like? Like, how do they do the mold? Like, how does that happen? Do you have to get you have to get hard for it, I assume, yeah. right? And uh, you have I, to do that I all on your own holding record. The previous one was like from start to finish of getting hard and finishing being molded like 12 or 14 minutes. Mm -hmm. I did it in eight. I didn't know that it was a competition. I didn't know it was a contest either. And then <laughs> they told me and I was like, I didn't know we were competing. Wait, does this include the ball mold? Yeah. Everything Wait, so the dick and the ball mold, two separate molds was done in eight minutes, was still like almost half of the original record. Wow, that's impressive. So it's really just got to do with how quick can you get hard and mm -hmm. how well can you maintain it? Because if you can't maintain it for the minute that they need it held in the mold, they have to start all over. That's true because you can't be stroking it. No, it's got to sit. Which hard is like that's like my own. method is like to sit there and stroke. Yeah, like, of I etch myself, so I'm yeah. sitting there stroking and I essentially masturbate all day on set. Yeah, like that's really what I'm doing. Of course. So I couldn't do that. And I was told that the solution was going to be cold, <laughs> which it wasn't. That was a complete lie. It was nice and warm. So it was warmer than some vaginas I've been in. I wonder if they have had like fails, if they've tried for to sure. mold guys' penis and it they just like. They for sure had people fail. The guy asked me, he's like, do you want me to bring you a blue chew or two? And I was like, I asked him a, a series of questions because I've never actually taken a Viagra or Cialis. Mm -hmm. I've never thought it was necessary and i don't really feel like playing with my heart like that because mm -hmm. i know they're they are really bad for your heart mm -hmm. but he asked me and i was like no, no, no i think i'll be good he's mm -hmm. like are you sure I, we don't want to have to have you come back and i was like no i'm pretty confident in my abilities yeah i've been doing this for seven years i've shot over three thousand scenes not counting content scenes and never failed so i think I'm, wow i think i'll be all right wow all right, guys, we are going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to ask Lucas about the questions that you guys always have, like, how do I get into the industry? What advice would you give me? Um, are STDs an issue? Um, what are your fans like? Um, all that kind of stuff. So hang tight. We'll be right back. With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. All right, guys, we are back. So do you get a lot of like DMs um, from guys asking how to get into the adult industry? Because I know that I do. So I'm wondering how 
a male performer does every day every day and i mean do you even answer them anymore at this point no i i will if somebody reaches out to me on a paid platform because mm-hmm. my time is money and my time is very valuable absolutely so I, I don't have too much of it to spare so answering questions like that on free platforms is not really something i've, I've ever done mm-hmm. occasionally i might just on a whim because okay. i'm feeling nice or something yeah. be like oh yeah it's reach out to the agents but the information I have a hard time answering questions that are easily Googled. Mm. Like it's not, there is multiple ways into the industry for men and women, Mm -hmm. but the easiest one is to send pictures to an agent. Yeah. And if they like what they see, they'll ask you to come in for a meeting Mm -hmm. and then they'll set up a a trial shoot or something to see if you can actually do the job. And if you can't, they're not going to, you're not going to get any work. Yeah. So being able to, one, have the courage to approach an agent. I had an easier way in because I already knew the agent mm-hmm. because of my girlfriend at the time. Right. Now, that is one way in. The OnlyFans method has now come around. But a lot of those guys are finding out that performing for a company, say Digital Playground or Twisties or somebody like that, is not the same as shooting OnlyFans content. Correct. It's like comparing high school baseball to the MLB. Yeah. There's... I've been on sets for penthouse or bigger companies where there's 50 people on set. Yep. And you got to get your dick hard. Yep. In front of 50 random people. Yep. And fuck some chick right in front of you. And it's like, okay, well, this is a little overwhelming, but. You know what? So I did a show for Playboy TV called Adult Film School where we took amateur couples and shot professional sex tapes of them. So these were I guys. that's been done a couple of times. So every single guy was somebody who had never done a professional shoot. Um, so it's like my worst nightmare encapsulated in a TV show. Um, but I had a lot of fun doing it. Very grateful for the experience. Just want to make that clear. But I found that with the guys, a lot of times what got them, of course, the crew was intimidating the lights was the silence. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of them, you know, they like have sex with their girlfriend at home and like there's music music on or or something. They're at a party and Mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you know, there's a vibe. That was really new. That was really hard for me to get past. Yeah. Because I was one of those people. There was always a movie playing when I was having sex. Mm -hmm. There was always music or something other than complete silence and a, and a sound guy demanding utter silence. Yeah. And holding the boom oh. and staring at you. And you've got this mic like hanging over your head. And you're like, oh, shit. The, all the sound is on me. Yeah. I have to make this up. Yep. I was really bad at dirty talk when I was new. Mm-hmm. I was mute Yeah. because I was pretty much conditioned to be mute. They mm-hmm. Most people will tell you that they don't want to hear from the guy. Yeah. As I got older in my career I learned that I should probably speak up a little bit Mm -hmm. so I've now like kind of made a name for myself with my dirty talk Mm -hmm. and I am known as being one of the more vocal guys in scenes Mm, okay but that's really out of like I hate the silence yeah like if the girl's not talking I gotta say something because the silence is killing me (laughs) it's killing the mood it's killing the flow like you say something anything tell me how I'm doing I don't care yeah it doesn't have to be sexy yeah Describe, I, I tell new girls that all the time if I shoot with them and they're the, the director giving them one of these off camera, which mm-hmm. means talk more. It's kind of boring if the girl doesn't speak. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I don't know what to say. I'm like, just describe what's happening. I tell them the same thing. That's yeah. all you got to do. It's really just just describe it. Yeah. Tell me you like it. Tell yeah. uh, like I love your dick in my pussy. Exactly. Just. Your dick in my mouth tastes so good. Exactly. Like, yeah, but it's hard. It's an art. I mean, honestly, dirty talking oh, is an the, art. If you watch some of the pro girls that have mastered the art of dirty, Cherie talk, Deville, I feel like is like the some best. Some of those women could. Uh, I literally have to ask them to be quiet in scenes because I'm <laughs> believing everything they're saying, and I'm like, okay, enough gassing me up. You're killing me. Like I get it. I get. It. I we're good. We're good. It's fine. I think you shot that scene where Cherie slapped me with a. What was it like the the paddle? For like a sorority, like the sorority. Oh house. fuck! That? Yes. Y- wait, yes, yes, sorority. Gr- another digital playground shoot. Uh-huh. I think I remember that, and I was like, I don't, I don't know if he likes that. I wasn't a fan, but I was, <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I, I'm not sure he's gonna be into one that. One of those things that wasn't really discussed beforehand, but once before you're we had boundary checklists, which we have now. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But I was in the middle of it, going, oh well, 
this is here now. This is on the internet for good. Me just getting paddled. Great. I do remember that. Yeah. I do. Oh my God, I'd forgotten about that. That was a fun scene. <laughs> Speaking of movies that we've done together, um, tell us about how that rumor started that Kieran Lee was your father. Once again, another one of your movies for Digital Playground. Um, I believe you had casted Alexis Fox and Kieran as my parents. Yes. And you wanted to go the extra step above and shoot uh, premarital photo sets. And you had a bunch of photos staged around the house we were yeah, shooting at. Yeah, because it had to look like your family. So I, like, framed them. Yeah, oh, the, the, the attention to detail on that was phenomenal, honestly. Because you had even put... <laughs> A baby bump, a pillow, I'm assuming, <laughs> in Alexis's belly and took a maternity photo. I actually totally forgot about that. And I was the supposed baby <laughs> bump that had now grown up. And so we, the three of us, Alexis, Kieran and I had posted that picture and tagged each other on social media saying, oh, our, <laughs> a cute family, look at Lucas in the belly. And fans bought it for some reason. I don't know why. We were joking, but people took it seriously and... Kieran and I have just kind of ran with it. <laughs> Kieran would have had to have been like 10 when you were born. Yeah, yeah, just about like 12 or something. He's not much older than me. Yeah, which I guess is possible, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, theoretically, yeah. scientifically, could be. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. But yeah, that's how Kieran Lee became my dad. Speaking of, um, <laughs> speaking of dads, uh, what about your family? Does your family know what you do for a living? Yes, they do. And are, how was that? Like, when did you tell them? Well, or did they find out? No, I told them. I had no problem telling them. I'm very open with my family. I, I was raised extremely Christian. I was homeschooled until high school. Oh, wow. Went to a private Christian high school. My family is still very religious. Mm -hmm. But I moved out at 17 mm -hmm. and kind of did my own thing and kind of made it very clear to my parents that you can love me for who I am and accept me for who I am. This was long before porn or I don't need to be in your life. And I made it very clear that like, I, it wasn't necessary for me to continue with life without them in it. And mm -hmm. my parents pretty much got to the point of understanding that they just needed to accept me for who I am. Mm -hmm. And then I got into porn. So it was really not difficult to tell them like, mm -hmm. hey, this is what I'm doing now. Okay. It's like they kind of saw it as like, okay, whatever, he's just gonna do his own thing. And right. we either accept him for who he is or we lose the son. Right, and so they were willing to accept it. Yeah. Do you I mean, guys? It's a they see it for what it is. It's mm -hmm. a job at right. the end of the day. Did it's, it take them a while to get to that point where they saw it like that? My mom and I don't really discuss it in detail what I do. It's yeah. kind of just, it's one of those unspokens. We know what I do for a living, but it's not brought up all the time or anything yeah. like that. My dad is more open about it. He'll make jokes about it. And he follows my Instagram and things like that. And he thinks it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But the difference is between the two of them is just my mom doesn't really want to talk about it, which is fine. I get it. I don't really want to talk about it with my mom either. Yeah, I think it's like even any I hear this from a lot of people like any family who, you know, has one of their kids in the adult industry, even if they accept it, because you generally don't want to hear about your child's like sex life, whether or no. not it's a professional thing no. or like a personal thing. I, if I had kids, I wouldn't want to hear about yeah, it either. Yeah. Like, so it's just like one of those things you're like, OK, you know, this person has sex whether or not they do it for a living or personal, but it's not something that like a family discusses. Yeah. So. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about uh, SCDs. Um, was there, was that a concern for you when you came into the industry? Were you concerned about that? Not really because I understood the testing standards that the industry held, mm -hmm. which was pretty high. I mm -hmm. mean, me personally before porn, I had been tested maybe twice mm -hmm. and I had been sexually active for quite some time with a plethora of partners. So understanding that there was the 14 day uh, STD panel, everybody was on it and that was how we shot. I felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. There are some things that are changing currently in the industry with that. Um, there was currently a pretty decent sized outbreak of gonorrhea and chlamydia. Mm -hmm. And a lot of performers were passing the current standard test. Yeah, which was the urine test. The urine test. I am actually one of those performers. I've never done anal penetration, but when I went in to get swabbed, I somehow had chlamydia in my asshole. 
Oh, shit. But my urine passed, my throat swab passed, all my blood work passed. And you had no symptoms? None. Interesting. I had some digestive issues that I had probably dismissed as like digestive issues. Right. But I didn't have the common symptoms. Interesting. And then I was left sitting with, well, how long has that been there? Yeah. How long have I been peeing clean? Yeah. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there needs to be some restructuring within the industry, with the industry standard of yeah. testing. I definitely agree that swabs should be added to our gold standard panels. Mm-hmm. But that's a conversation that a lot of people are having difficulty understanding. Yeah, there is actually I saw an announcement today on Twitter that there's going to be an industry uh, meeting like town hall about adding swabbing to it should be added the STD panel you, test. You've been around the industry for a lot longer than I have. And how many times have you seen the standard for testing change? Yeah, because it needs to evolve with the times. Right. If we're using a testing standard that worked 10 years ago and things have changed drastically in the industry with content creators and OnlyFans platforms. And the the performer pool used to be like this. It was a pool. Mm -hmm. There was porn stars and mainstream performers and those were the people. And everybody had an agent and everybody shot with companies that all understood the testing protocols. And now it's kind of like a giant ocean. Mm -hmm. And there's no real standard or no real information on what the standard should be. And now with this dormant strain, I believe that the standard should change. Yeah. So that's interesting that you brought it up because I did see a lot of performers blaming content creators. There's no blame. About no, we're all the blame. The, because so just so the audience understands. So for the mainstream, you know, big adult studios, the brands, the people like I work with, we demand a 14 day test and we have to get copies of the test. I check everyone's tests before we even step on set. The performers look at each other's tests on set. Like we're very, very clear about that to the point actually where uh, MindGeek has a procedure that if the performer doesn't have a clean test the day before, like they can't go and test the day before yeah. and, and be counting on a clean test to come in the morning of a shoot because if they pop dirty, even if it's a false, positive, which has happened plenty of times, we mm-hmm. can't shoot them. So yeah. if they don't have a clean test ready to go that won't be expired the day before, I cancel them. Yeah. Um, so, and the thing is, is that with content creators, and I don't know why I assumed that people left to their own devices, like porn stars working with content creators. And to be clear, again, content creators, I would say are people who aren't shooting for the big mainstream brands. Um, they're doing their own OnlyFans and stuff like that, but they're working with, you know, some of the porn stars that work for the big brands. But I would have assumed, and I guess this is foolish of me, that the those people would demand testing from each other, just like we do on regular sets. But I guess when it's individuals... It's lack of communication. Yeah. People thinking that because you're shooting and filming adult content that you now understand the porn procedures yeah so i think it's a lot of assumptions Mm -hmm. and when you assume things you make an ass out of you and me yeah and i think that's kind of the situation we're dealing with is a lot of people assumed everybody was doing stuff correctly or they weren't asking to see tests because they don't have that crazy structure that like we have to follow it was was a free-for-all and now the free-for-all needs to be scaled back and regulated yeah because now health and safety is an issue yeah And this is what I I really like about our industry, you know, because we've had attacks from the government trying to regulate the industry. Um, You know, Measure B was the last one that we had to deal with. But we are very good at self-regulating. So this issue has come up. We shut down production for an entire week so that everybody could go get tested and we could try to, like, you know, get rid of this, this strain. And now that we've found that people are testing positive from the swabs, um, that weren't expecting it, we're addressing this issue and yes. trying to change the testing procedures to make sure that we don't continue to have this problem. Um, so speaking of condoms, because that was such a hot button topic, God, that was a few years ago. And I knowing- was, I lived through that one too. I was in the industry for yeah, all that, the yeah. Prop 60 stuff and everything. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've obviously done a lot of movies for Wicked Pictures before they were bought up by Gamma and they were a strict- condom only company that was where i made my bread and butter when i was new so tell me about performing with condoms like is that something that you would be like say if the government descends upon us again and and 
instills a condom mandate. How would you personally feel about that? I mean, I don't enjoy the government mandating anything. I don't think it's their place or their right to do anything or tell anybody what to do. But mm -hmm. that's my personal opinion. Saying it did happen, assuming, I mean, I wouldn't have an issue. I didn't have an issue performing with condoms before. Mm -hmm. I was notorious for being able to get through a whole scene with just one condom, which mm -hmm. is very rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Normally shooting a wicked scene. I mean, sometimes you're filming for an hour. Yeah. So going through 10 condoms was not unheard of. Right. But I wouldn't really have an issue with it so, personally. So you would be okay with it just because you're the like perfect no fail double shot apparently penis, like who can do anything but given the choice given the choice i would prefer not to and just stick with the testing right right because okay. as long as everybody adheres to the testing and we continue to change the testing to work with what's now needed mm -hmm. there shouldn't be an issue mm -hmm. okay um what do you think you'd be doing if you weren't a porn star probably training people that's kind of what i was doing before the industry mm -hmm. i trained a lot of what's called transition athletes guys looking to make the jump from college to the pros mm -hmm. because that jump is a bigger gap than most people would like to believe so are we talking about like just generic physical fitness or do you have a specialty <clears throat> speed agility strength longevity and mobility and flexibility I will say that you um, kind of changed my life because you came onto set one day with one of those Theraguns. Yeah. That was the first time I'd ever seen that. And that thing, I still, I had to use it last night because my hip's out, but especially during my pregnancy. I used mine this morning. Oh my God, that thing is fucking amazing. And I remember every time you come to set, I'm like, can you bring your Theragun, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was definitely looked at like the weirdo rolling up on set with a foam roller and a Theragun and everybody, what are you doing? Why are you stretching before a scene? I was like, because I treat this like a sport. Yeah. I've always been an athlete. I've always been a, a high performance athlete and extremely competitive in that space. So it's like, it made sense to me to assimilate the two. Mm -hmm. And it worked for me. Treating my body like an athlete would treat his body is how I've been able to do my job consistently, reliably, and as long as I've done it. Yeah, I mean, I always say that, you know, the people in our industry really are like sexual athletes. Yeah, we are. And the ones that are the most successful are the ones who treat it in that way. Do you have like a method that you go through to prepare yourself for a scene? Or do you just like overall keep your health up to par? I would love to have an actual routine that could stick, but you have to be adaptable so much in this industry, it's kind of hard to get on one program or yeah. one routine. Yeah. So being adaptable is definitely my biggest plus. Now I have some similarities and some things that I pretty much do. Like I have a protein shake that I've designed that helps. It's got a lot of herbs in it that are supposed to help blood flow and things of that nature. So I make sure I drink one of those every day if I'm performing that day or wait I make sure. Wait a minute, you have like a male performance shake yes and you haven't like fucking branded and monetized that I, I had some work to do on it to fine tune the recipe before i i did that but yeah I'm, that's one of the things i'm dropping along with the uh the molded dick wow i spent the last seven years doing all the work and now it's time to show like what i've been doing because i was years. gonna say i feel like that i feel like that is like you got something there yeah I kind of knew I did. That's why I spent seven years trying to fine tune the recipe and figure out what wasn't essential and what was essential into it and mm -hmm. what you didn't need or does it really work? Mm -hmm. So interesting. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Um, how connected to your fans are you? I mean, we talked about you have an OnlyFans and you do chat with your fans on there. What does your audience consist of? Is it women and men like what kind of what kind of fans do you have i have a very balanced uh fan base i'd say i'd say i have a fair amount of straight women a uh, fair amount of straight men and a fair amount of gay men mm -hmm. I, I mean a fan is a fan to me as long as you're supporting me and what i do mm -hmm. i'm gonna love you for it mm -hmm. so yeah i think a lot of um male performers have gay fans like and yeah. the and the gay fans love that they're straight like they yeah, love yeah. the straight male performer definitely like they're not I, even trying to like 
bring you over to the other side or i don't know maybe they are some do but i mean most of them don't most of them are extremely respectful that i'm straight and Mm -hmm. they want to adore me for being straight Mm -hmm. however be a fan of me for being straight and i'm totally cool with that as long as you're not forcing your opinion or your ways on me i don't care because i don't force the way i think or i live on anybody else yeah of course um what do you say to people who claim the porn industry is evil and women are degraded and victimized by it? And then why do you think we never hear that rhetoric concerning men? Like, how come we, you think that we don't hear like, oh, like men are being abused in the adult industry and we got to get like the men out? The same why reason, do you think it's the same women? reason that if um, Johnny comes home from high school and tells his dad that he fucked a female teacher. He's going to get a high five. But if Susie came home and told her dad that she just had sex with the high school teacher, the dad would be in his car with a shotgun. Mm. It's a societal standard. Mm -hmm. Men engaged in sexual activity is seen as like an achievement. Mm -hmm. And women, it's more seen as a scarlet letter. And I think that's got to do with societal standards more than it is porn. It's projection. Do you think that that's fair? No, not at all. Do you think it's changing? Yes. It should be changing faster, but I definitely think it's changing. Mm-hmm. Do you deal with stigma in your day-to-day life? Yeah. I uh, started selling my fitness program uh, online, and I actually went through a payment processor and opened an account to set up a POS system through them. And because I was using the same name, not even selling porn, mm-hmm. I was selling a fitness program. Mm-hmm. They actually kicked me off the platform Ugh. and I pleaded my case. I was like, look, I'm not I'm using my performer name, but I'm selling something completely opposite of because you are an athlete. Yeah, you are a sexual athlete yeah. and you're selling a program of athletics. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to hear it. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it goes both ways. Yeah, I went and found a different POS system that was willing to work with me, but yeah, still had to jump over that hurdle and it was kind of irritating. Right. But it was what it was. Uh, is that so is that performer um, program going to be available soon or is yes. it out? OK, I'm still working on it a little bit, but I will be releasing it within this 2023. Will that be combined with the Lucas Frost? Get your dick hard shake. Mm-hmm. Are you going to call it? Get your dick hard shake. Uh, what? You don't think that's a good title? No, <laughs> I don't think that's really, really the best title for it. I'd love to call it that, but I don't think it's really going to sell to the masses the way it should. Too obvious. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be received too well. Um, how do you feel about the fact that women are paid more than men in the porn industry? And it's probably, I mean, as far as I know, the only industry where women command a higher rate on average. I've always respected it. I yeah. No problem. I mean... You ask most people, their job is harder Mm -hmm. in in different aspects. Our job is harder when it comes down to the performing. Mm -hmm. We actually have to show that we're turned on. We actually have to do most. We carry most of the scene physically. Mm -hmm. But they're there three, four, five hours before us. Yeah. Sitting on set, sitting on a makeup chair. I mean, taking pretty girl stills, doing BTS interviews. They are the reason that porn is being made. Mm hmm. Which also, going back to the previous question, sucks that they get the most stigma for it. Yeah. Because it's like, they're the reason everybody's here. Yeah. And the stigma people are weird because I'm like, well, how do you know who any of us are Uh, if porn's so bad? Yeah. Why are you following us? You shouldn't even know who we are. Right. Because you're not looking at porn. No. Because you hate it. It's shame and guilt. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. It is pretty frustrating. Um, Ryan Keeley actually brought up an interesting point about the pay gap once that I don't know why I had never considered. And she was like, it's more expensive for us. Mm -hmm. We have to pay to get our nails done. We have to pay to get our hair done. Mm -hmm. We have to, you know, go tanning or like all these things that like women need to do to make themselves presentable. The only time I've worn makeup in a scene was when I had a cut or something on my head. Yeah. Like that's the only time a director's looked at me and been like, go to the makeup chair. Yeah. I show up just like this. Yeah. My wardrobes half the time, eh, take off what you're wearing and just go in your boxers. Yeah. Most of the time. I mean, there are other scenes where I've had to buy complete wardrobes or, but not to the point that the women have to. Right. That's they true have to too. Have, I have to forgot have about that. Lingerie and the director's like, did you wear this for anybody else? So what if I did? Yeah. 
you guys all shoot the same pictures anyways. <laughs> the wardrobe thing was something I forgot about. I think it's because I've been working for Mind Geek for so long and we buy all the wardrobe. Yeah. But I, I used to work for a lot of companies that, that, and I also have a huge wardrobe closet. So I have all my own stuff too that I bring. But I had forgotten that, yeah, a lot of I companies have, don't buy the wardrobe. I have never worked an office job and I probably have five suits, <laughs> 25 dress shirts and at least 15 pairs of dress pants and four pairs of dress shoes. I've never worked an office job. All that is porn wardrobe. Yeah. That reminds me actually. So, okay. So if there is a new guy who comes into the industry, um, what advice would you give to new guys? Cause that just, my head went to immediately like get a staple wardrobe that you need to bring to set. But is there anything else? Like, is there anything that you know now as an experienced <sighs> performer that you wish you had known when you started? Don't fangirl over a girl, even if you're excited to work with her. Mm. Be professional. You're now equal. You're on a, ne a level playing field. That was why the older industry veterans like Julia Ann liked to work with me when I was new, because I didn't come on set and act like a fan. Mm -hmm. I came that does creep the girls out. Yeah it, it's, yeah, it makes them uncomfortable. Now they feel like they're working with a fan when you're actually her equal. You're mm. on set. You already got in the door. You don't need to be a fan anymore. Yeah. So that would be my, I mean, I never did it. But that was probably because I always had a girlfriend and I knew that the women didn't want to be treated like that. Yeah. And I, I also don't typically fanboy over anybody, but. Yeah. That reminds me of a story um, with Elsa Jean. You can go back and watch our interview. We discussed it. But there was a very well-known male performer. He's not in the industry anymore. But when he started, he would, and I remember he would ask me for girls' dresses because he wanted the to flowers? send them flowers. Yeah. And I was like, that's a terrible my idea. Age, my, my agents, when I was new, tried to ask me to do that. And they're like, bring every girl flowers. And I was like, no, no, no because no, then you she's make, got a husband or a man. No, because then you make it a, like a date. You make it like more than just a job. And that's and weird. I'll read the girl when I get to set. Yeah, I'll read. I'm very good at picking up on people's energy. And, and I, I do have a reputation for being very standoffish until the scene starts. Mm hmm. But that's just giving people their space. Mm -hmm. I respect people's space. I understand that we're here to do a job and I'm not dating you. Yeah. Now, when it's time for me to get chemistry and build some passion up, I'm all in it. Yeah. But up until that point, I'm probably off in the corner with my headphones in, stretching, foam rolling. Yeah. Rubbing some CBD salve on my back or something. Yeah. Doing paperwork. There's so much that goes into it other than that. Yeah. No, that's a good point, because I definitely do know that there are some girls who like you get a new guy and he comes on set and he just like come, she's in the makeup chair and he just like wants to chat. And she's like, dude, I'll, like I'll, I'll come in. I'll introduce myself. Yeah, Be the, polite. The typical pleasantries. And yep. how, how long have you been in the industry? What agency are, mm -hmm. are you with? So on and so forth. And then I'll just kind of excuse myself. Yeah, they've got shit to do. They've got pretty girls to take. They've got some dialogue. They got a tease to shoot. Like you don't need to be all over them. Yeah. All right, so um, last thing that I want to talk to you about is uh, you just uh, created, created, got your own shoot house. Yes. So let's talk about that because I have said so many times on this podcast that my biggest issue with shooting is locations, which seems like the one thing that people never think about. But every like porn disaster story that I have has to do with a location like yeah. fucking every time it's never the performers it's the location mm -hmm. so tell us about like maybe why you arrived at this decision and actually if you have any great like disaster stories i love those okay uh i got to the point where i was pretty tired of the same houses that just aren't cleaned as well as they should be mm -hmm. i mean there's some of the houses that are used every day in the industry and I've been looking at some of the same bugs in corners for my entire seven year career. The bug hasn't moved, which means it hasn't been vacuumed in that corner for a very long time. <laughs> I really started the shoot house out of cleanliness issues and health issues and the fact that I didn't see this. The standard was very low for for a shoot house mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to find a private house that covers all the bases that a production needs. So tell us about what, what are those bases? I mean, most directors prefer privacy, uh, a gated house. Uh, the house has to be big enough to not just shoot porn on a couch. Like you have to have 
you have to host all the equipment. So you got to have a decent sized garage or a little area that the production can put all their, their lights and their cameras and everything like that. And you got to have an area for craft services and you got to have clean areas for these people to have sex in. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these set houses, they're using the same couches from seven years ago. Yeah. They're falling apart. They're deteriorating. The house is dilapidated. And so I kind of got tired of it. And as I slowed down on the actual shooting side and leaned more into like producing my own stuff for OnlyFans and stuff like that, I realized that it was something that was needed in the industry. So what, um, like, tell us about the place that you have. What is it? What marks does it hit? Clean, open, good lighting, natural lighting. The, the way the sun comes into the house doesn't blast you. Mm. So there's no like big direct sun Mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The lighting in the house is really nice, Mm -hmm. especially just natural like daylight. Yeah. Lots of windows, big, beautiful pool with a big view in the backyard. Pretty much hit every standard that I thought was necessary for a shoot house. Are you going to be living there as well or is it just a shoot house? It's not a shoot house in the sense that most of these shoot houses are that's Mm -hmm. not my main goal because Mm -hmm. i'm also producing my own content out of it right now i do let some select directors rent it out to shoot but it's it's not like one of the shot out 30 days shoot houses that right most people are thinking of so you're gonna have days in between shoots where it Mm -hmm. can actually be clean that's intentional yeah so it can be cleaned have you ever had any like besides obviously the dirty stuff any disastrous location set stories i mean i've been i've been asked to shoot some oily squirt covered scenes in some studios that don't have a shower (sighs) oil scenes are my least favorite. or you get out of the shower and you're like oh you guys have a towel (laughs) no (laughs) okay i'll just use my shirt it's fine or they do and it's been used like three times and you're just like You guys understand we are having sex here. Like we're all we're all swapping fluids. Like we care a little bit about like yeah some health standards maybe. Yeah, not asking for a lot. Yeah, I don't need a hazmat room. I don't need like a clean room. I just just a towel. A towel. Just just a clean towel. towel. Maybe laundered last week. (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) We were talking. um, Yeah, so we were actually talking about dirty locations earlier, and you were telling me about how, and we won't put him on blast but there is a shoot house that people shoot at a lot Mm -hmm. and he has this is what blows my mind because i've always like i always bring my own shit but you know that so he has like bedding on beds and it's you know he lives there but he has a lot of rooms that people shoot in and uh it kind of just blows my mind that people shoot on the bedding that's there and then like he doesn't clean it Mm -mm. and then somebody else shoots on the same bedding so you've got these beds that are just like, I mean, you can see it. It's like covered in cum stains. Yeah. And so you were at the point where like you were bringing your own bedding as the performer. To that house. To that house, yeah. which is crazy to me. It's mind blowing. And that I did it three or four times and I finally was like, fuck this. I'm doing it myself. Yeah. And I'm just going to do it better. It's kind of the point I got to with why I got into the industry to begin with. I was like, no way. This is like what's going on. Yeah. Like kids are failing. 19 year old kids are failing on, on three Viagra. Like no fucking way. I'm going to yeah. go in. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to show you that this is how you can do it better. Right. And it's kind of the same method I'm using with the shoot house. With the shoot house. Yeah. Like, wait a second. The standard needs to change. Yeah. I remember um, when I started shooting for a director and this is like, right. This is like me, like leaving the nest. Like I'd. It was the first time I'd ever shot for anybody besides my my mom and, and her company. And uh, he used to, we used to, first of all, we shot in like the dirtiest locations. I remember there was this one place where the owner had a parrot, but like he didn't keep him in a birdcage. Oh, just flew around the, the parrot house. just walked around, like the whole living room was its cage and there was bird shit. I'm not joking all over everything, all over the furniture, on the couch, fucking everywhere. And you were supposed to shoot in there. And I just remember coming in and being fucking horrified. I was like, wait, how? This is, this is disgusting. He also only had, in terms of bedding, 
he had two comforters. That was it. Just the comforters. No pillow sets, no sheets, no nothing. One was like green and one was this horrible floral thing. And he would bring it to... Too busy to shoot. Yeah. And he would bring it to every set and he'd never wash them. And so like he'd throw it on a bed or like, you know, sometimes if the scene calls for you shooting outside and it's dirt and you don't want to fuck on the dirt, he put like this comforter on the floor outside, which just makes no sense. whatsoever. So I became so offended that I started taking those comforters home and washing them myself because I was so fucking grossed out. And then I was also like, these are the ugliest things I've ever seen. So I bought him and I, I keep these in my van as well. A whole diff- like selection of various faux fur throws yeah. um, because in different colors, because those actually can look nice. nice. Like if you're shooting yeah. on a couch and they don't want you to have sex on the couch or the couch is dirty or whatever, if you throw like a comforter on it, it looks really odd. But if you put like a nice faux th- mm-hmm. throw, it looks like a Pottery Barn there's, catalog. It's like a that. a couple of them Fine. all over my house. Yeah. Those things are great. So I always have those in my van. I always bring my own bedding. I have like so many different kinds of bedding and it's fitted sheets and matching pillow sets and the whole thing. So, um, but yeah, that's when I first got like introduced into the fact that people were just, cause that, you know, I came from my mom's world where, you know, and we had set designers and we had style it, we had everything, everything and we were covered. really like, and then you get into gorilla porn and it's like bird shit <laughs> all over the I've living shot, room. I've shot in a, at an office location in Beverly Hills. Cause locations like that are very hard to come by. Yeah. Like not everybody just wants to rent out their office for a, yep. a sexy secretary sex scene. Mm, yeah. I walked in there and I kid you not, there was dog shit all over this, this office building. Like, and it was like an, an office, like they used it every day. We were only allowed to shoot there on Sundays. I know the place you're talking about. I haven't been there, but I, I know that there's dog shit in corners of that office. <laughs> and I'm like, one, you couldn't pick that up. Two, you just let your dog shit and piss on your carpet in your oh office. My God. Yeah. And then not even a puppy pad or, or nothing. <laughs> okay. I just I don't understand how people can live like that. That's a pretty shitty situation. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, Lucas, thank you so much for coming on. This thank has you. been really great. So fun. It's been wonderful uh reconnecting with you because yeah, I kind of nice catching up. I kind of stopped shooting boy girl like yeah. a while ago. I was just doing twisty stuff, which is just girl girl. So I haven't seen you in forever. I probably haven't seen you because I haven't gone to. I kind of just removed myself from industry related mm-hmm. events. And yeah. I oh, know. I don't go either. <laughs> yeah. So we definitely never <laughs> see each other. AVN. Uh, I haven't really stepped foot in one of those in a while. So it's yeah, like, I probably haven't seen you in five years. No, it's been that long. Yeah. I know. Co- COVID made everything weird because I definitely haven't yeah. seen you since COVID. Definitely, and that's. And that I feel years. like, yeah, that threw everybody. Four years. Wow. Something like that. Amazing. Well, you look great. You look the same. So do you. I'm sure your penis looks great too. Well, he's hanging same. in there. He's <laughs> got a lot more miles on him now. <laughs> um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? And any anything else you want to plug? Like, where can people find this amazing new hard dick shake and oh, program that's all that you're come creating? Through any of the platforms that like I'm gonna list right now. Okay, so great. you can catch my Instagram is friends with the cool kids, all one word. Or my Twitter is Lucas X Frost. And then my OnlyFans would be OnlyFans slash Lucas X Frost. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Instagram, Holly Randall. Um, and on Twitter it's the same. And this actually comes out, so the audio version of this comes out the day that I will be flying into Vegas for the AVN show. I will be at the AVN show. Um, I will be at the browsers booth uh, promoting the new metaverse platform that I'm working on joy city. So make sure that you come by and say hi. Um, And again, happy new year, everybody. Thank you guys so much for watching to support the show. Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. See you next week.